And we make our beginnings in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Read your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. The Lord detests the way of the wicked, but he loves those who pursue righteousness. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you desire not the death of sinners, but rather that they turn from their wickedness and lie. Mercifully pardon our sins. Enable us to resist all evil and to live godly lives as you, your much-loved children. Help us to follow the example of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who endured the cross for us. And may we walk in his steps until we possess the kingdom that has been prepared for us in heaven. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. In the reading of the Passion Gospel, those who had arrested Jesus brought him to the high priest's house where the scribes and elders were assembled. Peter followed him afar off, and so did another disciple. And that disciple was known to the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So that other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the doorkeeper and brought Peter in. He went in and sat with the servants to see the end. He was warming himself at the fire they had kindled in the middle of the courtyard. Meanwhile, the chief priests and the whole council were seeking evidence that might make the case for a death sentence. But they could not find any Many bore false witnesses against him, but their statement did not agree. Two stepped forward and said, We heard him say, I shall destroy the temple made with hands, and after the beginning of the third day, I will build another not made with hands. But even on this point, their evidence did not agree. Then the high priest stood up, moved to the center, and put this question to Jesus. Do you have no answer? What is this evidence they have given against you? But he was silent and gave no answer. Again the high priest put a question to him and said. Are you the Christ the son of the blessed? And Jesus said I am. You will see the son of man seated at the right hand of God's power. And coming with clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, Do we still need any witnesses? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your opinion? And they all declared that he was liable for death. Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. One of the maidservants of the high priest came and saw Peter warming himself. And she looked at him closely as he sat in the light of the fire and said, You also were along with the man from Nazareth, that Jesus. 
Peter denied it and said, I do not know what you mean. And he went out to the forecourt. Another maidservant saw him there and said to those who were standing around, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And Peter denied it again with an oath. I do not know the man. And a little later, those standing around said to Peter, Surely you are the one of them. You are a Galilean. Your accent gives you away. And Peter took an oath, calling down a curse upon him. I do not know the man. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the crowd, the, the cock crowed a second time, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. Peter broke down and went out and wept bitterly. They said, what is that to us? That is your affair. Judas threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed. He went and hanged himself. And in this way was fulfilled what, the spoken, what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet saying, they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by the children of Israel and gave them for the potter's field. Here ends the reading of the passion of our Lord. There were so many human witnesses to the events which took place on the hill outside of Jerusalem nearly 2,000 years ago when our Lord was crucified. But there were other witnesses there as well, ones we don't usually think about, although they were even closer to the events than the crowd. In fact, they participated in those events in unique ways. Tonight, we hear one of these stories. few moments of your time. Sir, I know your position and stature, but please give us just a moment. Tell us about the events of that dark Friday as you witnessed the whole ordeal. You know, I don't have to be here. I hope you realize that fact. As an official representative of the government, still in active government service, I don't have to testify I don't want to. Yes, sir. I understand. I just thought it would be better if I reminded everyone 
that I'm still an official weapon of the government in power and that mine is a position of responsibility and authority. In and the sir, right we, hands, we respect that, that fact. I've fought fierce battles with enemies of superior numbers and force. I've seen men die fighting for the honor of their country and their king. I've even brought enemies to their knees and to their graves in honor of country and king. I've been held at attention when the governor passed by and I've held off angry crowds at the gates of the palace. I've pierced the flesh of would-be anarchists and terrorists, and I've saved the life of my ruler on more than one occasion. I've been used by skilled soldiers, and I've been used by cowards in uniform. But no one is using me now. I'm here because what I witnessed needs to be told, and it needs to be told accurately. We respect your credentials, sir. Now, would you please tell us about that day? I guess the best place to start is in the courtyard. That's where I first came in contact with the accused. He was on trial for heresy. He was also being tried for treason. They said he was a threat to the government because he called himself king. Actually, the way I heard it, everyone else including those who were trying him, called him a king. All he said was, if that's the way they see it, so be it. He agreed with them, but he didn't flaunt it. I really didn't see him as much of a threat to any of us. Even at my age, I could have handled any of his followers. They weren't even armed. Well, he was found guilty, and I found that strange found it strange there were no real charges against him the witnesses kept telling differing stories and contradicting themselves and each other the judges passed him from one to another because none of them wanted this political hot potato and when they finally found him innocent the mob took control of the process and frightened the judges into sentencing him to death I've been witness to many trials, and so I can testify. He got a raw deal. When the sentence was handed down, it was time to start that long walk up the hill again. I've been there a number of times. Usually, a person only makes the trip once, if you get what I mean. Yes, sir. Uh, please continue. The trip up the hill was not uneventful. It was confusing duty, as it often is. Some of the time I was used to hold back people in the crowd who cried and screamed that he was innocent. Some pushed toward him saying they just wanted to touch him to be healed of some illness. This was not your usual crucifixion crowd. Mm, I see. And yet, something made it clear that this was not the usual type of person on his way to be executed. A couple of times I was used to wrap him on the back of the legs. He wasn't in much shape to be carrying a cross. He'd been through a lot of beatings. His head was still bleeding from the crown of humiliation they put on him. Actually, it was a crown made of the meanest looking thorns I've ever come across. As we went along, he fell a few times. Each time he fell, I was used to prod him along. There was no effort to treat him with any respect. In fact, I've never heard such a variety of noises from a crowd. There was cursing and hateful yelling as he passed by, and then a step or two farther, and you'd hear someone praying for him or telling him they loved him. Sounds confusing. If it sounds confusing, that's because it was. We finally made it to the top of the hill, I assumed that I'd be at attention all the time, but I was in for a surprise. The guard carrying me and a couple of the other guards got into an argument over who would get to keep his clothes. As you know, Mo, may know, soldiers are notorious souvenir hunters. 
It isn't like they were arguing over some fine king's robe. It was just a simple cloak. Well, I got tossed to the ground during the argument. They decided to roll a dice to see who would get the cloak instead of cutting it into pieces for each one to have a memento. So while they were shooting dice, I had to lie unflatteringly in the dirt beneath the cross. Throughout this whole ordeal, I have not held my head as high as I used to, but this was most degrading. But then, so is being crucified, I would imagine. Yes, sir. The morning sun was getting hotter and hotter as I lay still in the dirt. At first, I was directly in the sun's rays, and I could feel my staff drying out and my head getting hot enough to scorch anyone who would pick me up carelessly. As the sun shifted, I began to cool. As the shadow of the cross and the body on it passed over me, I was thankful for that relief from the heat of this totally humiliating scene. It seemed odd that I'd be thankful that an innocent man was hanging on a cross, but selfishly I was. Because he was hanging there, I was given relief. I was refreshed, and I was even able to forgive the thoughtless guard who tossed me aside. It's amazing how different I felt in the shadow of that cross. Well, please tell us you know, how it felt. What, what was it like? As I lay there, I was looking straight up at the one hanging on the cross. His head hung down. I could see his agonized expression. He seemed like a person who was deeply hurt. I don't mean hurt from the pain of the whippings or the long walk or the puncture wounds or the thorns or the penetrating nails in his hands. I mean the kind of hurt when you've been or what can I call it, betrayed, that's it, betrayed. I know that feeling as I serve this crummy crucifixion duty, but that's nothing to what he's been through. Hmm. Oh. I heard that one of his own cabinet members had betrayed him with a kiss, and another had betrayed him by denying to even know him, and that others betrayed him by running away during all of this. He seemed to have the weight of all the betrayals in the world on his shoulders and on his face. But even with that agony clearly seen on his face, his words were words of love. Love. Now, I'm not a judge of character, but if I were a human being and was treated like that, you'd not hear words of love coming from my mouth, things like, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, that's something only a very special someone could say and really mean at a time like this. And do you know what? He meant what he said. He really, truly meant it. You could tell it in his voice, and you could see it on his face. When he spoke those words of forgiveness... The agony on his face turned to a smile of assurance, as though he knew that his request was granted. He looked at peace then. He was no criminal. He was no threat to the government. What this world needed was more like him. Can you imagine what the world would be like if his kind of love could be found in more people? My guard came and picked me up. I thought we were going to leave, but I heard the others mention that the bodies couldn't be left on the crosses because of some religious days. So it was decided to help the men die a little faster. The soldiers were instructed to break the criminal's legs. They often used a heavy mallet to do that. If anything could crush their bones, it could. Well, they took care of the other two criminals as they were instructed. And then they noticed that the one called King had already died. So instead of breaking his legs, it was decided to check and make sure he was dead. That's where I came in. I was lifted toward him. 
my first thought was that I wanted to get another look at the face of this forgiving philanthropist. I wanted to be close to his gaze and to his heart, but his gaze was gone. His eyes were closed in death. His heart had stopped beating. Yet it seemed as though his forgiveness was still there. At any rate, I did get closer to his heart than I had expected. You see, in order to make sure that he was dead, I was forced into his side with a thrust that felt as though all of mankind was pushing me in, not just one lone guard. And what did you find there? What I found there was a broken heart, a heart which once beat for love and seemed to have been beaten by hate. But I quickly found out that that was only partly true. Only partly true? Yes, his heart had beaten out of love. His whole being was love, but hatred had not beaten him. I know that for a fact. Let me tell you how I know. As I was pulled from that lifeless side, both blood and water flowed out with me. As that blood poured over me, I had a feeling shoot from the tip of my pointed head to the foot of my staff. I felt sharper than I'd ever been. I felt polished to a flawless sheen. I felt as though my staff were alive, as if rooted in healthy soil again. And then, as the water engulfed me, I knew that if I had been a person, I too would have been forgiven for my role in all of this. Well, you, you certainly can't blame yourself. I mean, after all, you're just, you know, uh, you're just an instrument in the hands of others. It certainly isn't your fault. I assume that you know that you had a very active role in all of this too. It was the sins of everyone, and that includes you. That broke his heart and caused him to suffer and die. That's why he hung there, because someone had to, and he didn't want it to be you, so he took your place. Mm. Yes, sir. We're aware of that. The most important part of what I witnessed was made clear a couple of days later, but that's another story. In the meantime, though, we all can share the assurance that the blood and water which flowed from the wound I caused, the wound you caused, flowed forth with the power to cleanse, to purify, to restore, and to renew. Isn't it interesting that a painful wound was used by God to allow his love and forgiveness to flow out for all the world? You get the point? Thank you. And we thank Richard Hallman for being our voice this evening. We now worship the Lord with our offering.
prayer? Lord Jesus Christ, your enemies laughed, soldiers scoffed, the religious leaders ridiculed you. You were whipped and beaten and spit upon. They crowned your head with thorns. They placed a royal robe on you and mocked you, crying, Hell, King of the Jews. They led you to Calvary's hill and used nails to secure you to the cross. And they used a spear to pierce your side to acknowledge your brutal death. You accepted the thorny crown. You wore the robe of mockery and you allowed them to nail your hands and your feet. But the nails were unnecessary because your love would have held you there. The piercing of the spear into your side towards your heart shed your blood. To cover the sins of the world. Oh what love. With that piercing you came into our world to save sinners. And you would not save yourself. So that every sinner could be redeemed. Thank you Lord Jesus. For loving us into death. Even death on a cross. May we come to know you more this Lent as we meditate On what happened so long ago. Make us more aware of the power and meaning of this act of love carried out on your behalf. Draw us closer to you that we will walk with you in willing obedience. And follow your example of love and sacrifice. During this Lenten season empower the message of the cross as it is as it is preached read discussed shared viewed and witnessed to arouse the indifferent stir up the lukewarm encourage the timid assure the doubting calm the disturbed and console the sorrowing and may our faith in you be strengthened and confirmed be with all who are sick hospitalized homebound or struggling today with a need an anxiety a grief, a sadness, a fear. Be with the people of the Ukraine in the bloodshed and turn the hearts of Putin and the Russian people from evil to good, from hatred to compassion. Thank you for receiving our praises and answering our petitions. For we come to you as your children, subjects of the King of Kings. And you taught us a prayer that in faith we speak to our Father, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen.